Uh, so as the last speaker of the conference, I have the privilege and the duty to thank the organizers for organizing this beautiful conference. Let's uh, thank you. And then, and then I thank them for giving me the opportunity to, to give this talk. I'd like to thank the participants who survived till the end of this uh, long, long conference. Uh, so as the last speaker, I have the privilege of drinking from this bottle. So it was, this will not be considered impolite. So the work I'm going to talk about is uh, based on uh, something we've been discussing with me, Naganajik, and Samson Shetashvili for the last year or so. And uh, for me, it's part of the kind of a bigger project, uh, which I loosely call BPS-CFT correspondence on non perturbative dyson springer relations or equations. So, uh, per organizer's instructions, uh, the talk was supposed to be accessible to everyone. So there will be maybe four introductory sections, introductory sections, sessions, sections of this talk. Uh, so I apologize to those who know everything. You can leave now. All right. So there are two ways of realizing a symmetry in quantum system. Uh, it's like, like there are 50-50 chances of meeting a dinosaur, you know, when you go outside. So one way is uh, explicit. When you have a classical, start with a classical system with, with some symmetry and then quantize it. And so the example of that is a geometric quantization. You start with, a, let's see, can I work this thing? Yes. So you start with a co-joint orbit of, a, of some group. So the quadrant orbit is a homogeneous space for the group. The group acts on it explicitly, preserves the symplectic form, and then you write the path integral with the, uh, the inverse of the symplectic form. It is not globally well-defined, but the integral will be well-defined if the orbit is quantized in a in certain sense. And then you couple it to the moment map for the group action uh, to some background gauge field, and out comes the matrix element of the uh, uh, path ordered exponential of this gauge field in the representation of the group corresponding to its quadrant orbit. So that's the magic quantization. And then there is a second way where you start with a system which doesn't have the, class, the, the symmetry explicitly, but the symmetry may emerge in the quant in quantum system. So uh, today we're going to discuss uh, the, the relation between these two approaches, so to speak, in, in a class of examples. So this will not be a general story because it's a physics talk. Uh, so to present the class of examples, I need some preparations, which most of you, again, know, but uh, I will repeat for the completeness sake. sake. So we'll start with, uh, uh, we pick a finite subgroup of, of the group SU2. As you know, there are, there's an AD classification of the such groups. Uh, it has some set of reducible representations, Ri labeled by some label I from zero to R, zero corresponds to trivial representation. And then there is a way to build a graph by taking the tensor product of, uh, of an rep with a two-dimensional defining representation of this uh, of SU2, of, of, of the subgroup of SU2. And that gives you, uh, so the, looking at the decomposition of the tensor product into reducibles, you will get a graph uh, with vertices corresponding to reps and edges uh, labeling uh, connecting the representation and uh, the representations which appear in the decomposition of the tensor product. It's a familiar stuff. And so it's well known that the graphs which will appear this way are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the fine thinking diagrams of uh, simple uh, Lie groups. So there is this A type, D type, and E type. And then the dimensions of these original representations correspond to so-called Dinkel labels, which have uh, grouped theoretic meaning, which I will not discuss today, and they trivially solve this uh, system of linear equations. Now, uh, sorry, which way do I go? Okay, so by identifying the, the graph which you get by, uh, by studying representation theory with finite group, with thinking diagrams, you get a correspondence between finite subgroups of SU2 and uh, simple E groups. That le so this is just a combinatorial identification. And uh, 
trying to so uh, trying to understand where this this correspondence comes from if you are follow the physics path it will eventually lead you to string theory construction which will I will use today so the uh, an object which we built is this uh, the geometric object is the ALE space it's a resolution sing of singularities of the quotient of C2 on which this group acted uh, by the group uh, gamma. So this, this is the C2 mod gamma is an orbifold, a singular space, but you can deform it in the class of uh, four-dimensional hypercalibre manifolds. And that gives you a smooth, in general, well, it gives you smooth for generic deformation, uh, a smooth uh, four-dimensional variety uh, with a set of two cycles, non-trivial two cycles, which intersect according to the finite Dinkin diagram. So in the, in the previous uh, picture, you remove the green node and you get the, the, uh, the graph whose vertices would correspond to non-contractible two spheres and the two vertices will be connected if these two spheres intersect, and if the section number is one. Uh, it turns out that uh, if you look at the space of parameters of these deformations, locally it's actually it's a vector space. So each sphere comes with three parameters uh, coming from the periods of symplectic forms, three symplectic forms. But globally, there, is, there are identifications. So if you go around this moduli space, you come back, uh, these parameters can be permuted by an action of, of, of certain discrete group, which happens to be a wide group of the corresponding AG Lee group. So that's one of the hints that, uh, that the relation be, uh, to, between discrete groups, finite subgroups of SU2 and uh, simple Lee groups is more profound than just coincidence. Uh, now, to see the actual symmetry, uh, we need some object on which the symmetry will be acting. And uh, so in, in, in physics community, the, this, this uh, symmetry structures come under the name of the Kajima algebras. But physically, what you do, you uh, study a 4 plus 1 dimensional gauge theory, or supersymmetric, or rather supersymmetric gauge theory, with unitary gauge group on the space-time of the form, the product of this ALE space, which now I wrote as a, as a real four-dimensional manifold, times uh, time, real time. And uh, in some, well, in some low energy weak coupling approximation, the field configurations which you will be interested in would be instantons the, uh, on, on, this, on the ALE slice of the space-time. And so you will have time-dependent instant configurations. So, uh, at adiabatic, so in adi adiabatic approximation, you will be studying a supersymmetric quantum mechanics on the moduli space of, of these instantons. And if you have, a, with sufficient supersymmetry, the ground states of these quantum mechanics would correspond to some cohomology uh, groups of these moduli spaces. Now, these moduli spaces have two sets of uh, uh, discrete parameters. One set of parameters corresponds to the uh, breaking of, uh, to the choice of boundary conditions at infinity. So that at infinity, the, uh, the space looks like, uh, uh, so on R4 at infinity you have S3, the three-dimensional sphere, but when you quotient by the group, discrete group gamma, this three-sphere becomes a length space, which is non-simply connected. And so the uh, instant configuration uh, approach is a flat connection. Flat connection is a homomorphism from gamma to the gauge group, and this homomorphism will break the gauge group down to a subgroup. So this is the subgroup which commutes with the image of the uh, holonomy of flat connection. So this W0 to WR are labels which correspond, which are attached to the vertices of the quiver. And so that's one set of, set of labels, and another set of labels uh, correspond to the topological charges. So you have a gauge field, so it may have a, uh, the, uh, the four-dimensional instanton charge, and it may have magnetic fluxes, because this is UW gauge group. And so these fluxes uh, could go through either of these two spheres, so you have an, uh, an integer per, per, per two sphere, and one integer which, which corresponds to the full space. So you have R plus one integers, which usually are called V, V0 to VR. And so, uh, as I said, in supersymmetric quantum mechanics, the ground states would correspond to cohomology of this ALE space, of this modular space of instantons on the ALE space. And the striking result of Nakajima from the early 90s 
was that this, uh, if you take the direct sum over all instanton charges, fluxes and instanton numbers, but you keep the, uh, uh, the boundary condition at infinity fixed, the resulting space will be a, rep a representation of Katz-Moody algebra based on the Mackey dual uh, Lie group. So this affine thing, so the quivers of the, uh, of the group gamma will become literally the affine thinking diagrams of the corresponding Kasmudi algebras, which will actually act on this space of cohomologies. And that's surprising uh, for the classical, uh, from the classical point of view, because this group, neither the group gamma, neither the group G uh, sub gamma, nor the Kasmudi version, doesn't, they don't act on the modular space of instantons. In fact, if they acted, they do not they would not have induced the action on the cohomology because the continuous actions, uh, continuous symmetry action on, on, on the space. Yes, what's the question? <laughs> ah, okay, thank you. Yeah, there, there was some, yeah, that's right. Yes, you're right, you're right, right. Uh, 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 thank you. Uh, so the, the, uh, the continuous symmetry group action doesn't induce an action on cohomology. Uh, so the way Nakajima constructed this, uh, uh, this action was using something which at that time was kind of novel for physicists, let's say. Uh, so he used correspondences uh, between, between these different uh, modular spaces. I will not review this, this today. I'll just, so the claim is that by uh, studying the corresponding uh, cohomology groups, uh, and now you can even refine this, this statement. You, uh, uh, you can work equivalently with respect to various symmetry groups. And the group, uh, so one, 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 one of the symmetry groups was this uh, unbroken gauge, gauge symmetry group, HW, the product of unitary groups. And another is U1, which uh, descends from the symmetry of the uh, ALE space in the case where, uh, sorry, when you fix some of the deformation parameters, uh, to, so you, you restrict yourself to a special locus in the space of deformations, namely in, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in, in some basis where you can split the parameters into real and complex, you set the complex parameters to zero. And in, that, in this case, all the least spaces have a U1 isometry, and so that isometry continues to act on the modular space of instantons. And so equivalent, the equivalent action, the equivalent cohomology will actually produce a, a representation of a Yangian of the corresponding Kasmuni group. And in fact, this U1 action is sort of the most important one because that the equivalent parameter for that uh, symmetry corresponds to what you would normally call Planck constant. Now, more generally, uh, you don't have to study instantons on the least space. The, you can, you can uh, so in fact, Nakajima de defined a more general class of uh, hyperkähler hyper manifolds, which are called quiver varieties. You can assign, associate them to any uh, quiver that is an oriented graph with some conditions, with, uh, with some, uh, um, with a choice of a presentation. So in assignment of labels to uh, W and V for each vertex of, of this graph. And uh, so you can study again the supersymmetric quantum mechanics on, on the square variety. And uh, so the Kajima will produce for you a, a certain algebra which will act on, on, on the equivalent cohomology of the square variety. And it will be a representation of the Yangian of the Kasmudi group built, uh, built on this quiver. Uh, you can also do this uh, in, you can, so there are various upgrades of the statement. Instead of, instead of the supersymmetric quantum mechanics on the quiver variety, you can do a loop version of that, where you st study supersymmetric quantum mechanics on loop space, which is something like a Seeger model. And then the ground states for that model would be the uh, K-theory of the corresponding quiver variety. And uh, Nakajima showed that in this way, you will see the quantum affine algebra uh, built on, the, on this Kasmudi, group, uh, Kasmudi algebra acting. So, What's surprising uh, about these statements is that you don't see the symmetry realized in a specific quantum system. So quantum mechanically, uh, 
it's okay to fix the uh, to fix uh, both v and w. So for each individual space, you have a well-defined supersymmetric quantum mechanics. But in order to see the symmetry, you need to sum over all v's. And so it's, it means that this full symmetry, this beautiful symmetry, is realized not in a single quantum system, but in a collection of quantum systems. Uh, now, the su summation over the v over v over uh, instant on charges would be natural in the four plus one dimensional gauge theory. Unfortunately, this is not a quantum field theory. So we, it's not a. If, if you uh, so classically, you can study a four plus one dimensional gauge theory, but to quantize it, the best option we know is to embed this into string theory. Uh, now, in string theory, string theory realization of gauge theory, <coughs> the summation of the, the V labels would be natural. And also in string theory, the appearance of the group uh, G sub gamma is natural, as I will review later. So all these hints at uh, uh, the fact that we should think about using string theory to explain the emergence of the symmetries and to think about various ways they're realized. And after all, this is a strings math conference, so strings should, should appear. Okay, so, but let's go back a little bit. So I mentioned Youngians. Let's just review, let's just review a little bit of <coughs> what is a natural habitat for Youngian algebras. Where do we uh, meet them? And if you follow the standard, you know, course in mathematical physics, you will first encounter Youngians in the study of spin chains. So for example, if we start with Youngian of SL2, the simplest uh, Youngian algebra, you can <coughs> study its representation in the fine dimensional Hubert space, which is a product of several copies of, L, let's say, L copies of a two-dimensional representation of SU2. And that uh, problem arises when you think about ferromagnets and uh, the simplest Hamiltonian you can write for the system of uh, uh, spins. So these are spins, spin one halves. And this is a space, Hilbert space of states of the system of L spins. Um, so it turns out that this Hamiltonian, which uh, uh, Heisenberg introduced as a simplest model of uh, one dimensional ferromagnet, uh, with the periodic identification that the last spin is the first one, so it's the shift by L. Uh, uh, Acts trivially on on the sp on the spin uh, matrices, so these are just Pauli matrices attached to the uh, spin sites. So this system is called Heisenberg magnet, and in more uh, detailed nomenclature, this is periodic isotropic homogeneous spin chain. So it's periodic. This is a periodic condition. It's isotropic because all the coefficients of all spin spin terms are equal, and it's homogeneous. Uh, well. As you can see, you can shift. So there is a shift symmetry here. So the beauty, beauty of this system is that it's actually quantum integrable. So in addition to the Hamiltonian, which we started with, there are other operators which are, in some sense, independent, which commute with this H1, with the first one. And uh, so, so the, there is enough of, of such operators to uh, to call the system quantum integrable, but more precisely, uh, you could. So, what does it mean to be? What does it mean in this context? Is that uh, the the joint eigen eigenvectors of all these operators will have uh, will be simple spectrum. So you can I characterize the eigen uh, vectors by specifying the eigenvalues of all, all, all these operators. Now, one convenient way of packaging these Hamiltonians, I didn't explain what these Hamiltonians are, and that's because they, it's very hard to, 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 to write them one by one unless you find a clever way of organizing them into, sorry, into, uh, which way do I go? Yes, into the generating function. And this generating function is called a transfer matrix for a reason which will be clear uh, in a second. So, uh, so basically, here you just form a generating function where you just add them all, all these Hamiltonians with some coefficient x to the minus n, where x is, is an auxiliary variable. And quantum integrability is equivalent to the statement that, well, it's not equivalent, but it, the, the statement that all Hamiltonians commute 
pairwise commute is equivalent to the statement that these uh, operators commute at different values of the uh, parameter x, uh, spectrum, sometimes called spectral parameter. Now, it's a transfer matrix for the following reason, that you can actually build it. Uh, so remember, the space of states of our system is a tensor product of, of, uh, of L copies of, uh, of a spin one half representation of SU2. It turns out that there is a, uh, there is a special matrix, which is called the R matrix, which acts in a tensor product of two two-dimensional representations to itself. In fact, this is actually a specification of something which is called the universal R matrix, which is an element of the tensor, complete tensor product of Yang and it's to itself. But again, if you follow the traditional textbook, this is introduced as just a four by four matrix obeying certain equation. And then you can uh, uh, build the uh, transfer matrix by taking the tensor product. Uh, so by taking the product of uh, L copies of uh, these R matrices acting uh, between the uh, incoming sp spaces and some auxil additional auxiliary space, and then taking the trace over the auxiliary space. And you can also, uh, so, uh, so there are, uh, this R matrix depends on, 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 on parameters, so the, spec the so-called speckled parameters, and you can as assign these parameters to the actual individual vector spaces uh, in the sense which uh, will be clear, maybe. Uh, and so you get, uh, by taking the trace over the auxiliary space, you get, you, you end up, you, you're left with an operator which acts uh, in the tensor product of, of the, uh, so of these individual vector spaces. Now, this R matrix, the beauty of it is that it solves the so-called young box equation. So it, it uh, realizes a representation of a braid group. And this equation implies that the transfer matrix, which was built as a product of, of our matrices and then uh, traced over the auxiliary space, will, will solve this equation that it can use the different values of, of a spectral parameter. In Russian, this is called the train argument. So you, this is the way the pick, the uh, picture proof of, of the uh, commutativity uh, in one line. If you haven't seen this, you, you should probably spend a couple of minutes thinking about it. If you've seen this, then you know it. Okay. Uh, now, so as I said, so this R metric depends on parameters and you can keep these parameters at some generic positions and this way you will get the so-called inhomogeneous spin chain. So these parameters will actually enter the results in Hamiltonians. The Heisenberg spin chain corresponds to the case where all these all this, uh, parameters, all inhomogeneities were set to zero. It's a special case. And in addition, you can also insert a certain uh, element of the uh, spin group, in this case SU2, uh, put it under the trace, and uh, uh, it's the result in transformatics will still have the property that it, uh, it, the, these matrices commute at different values of x, of the x parameter. And so if you do this, so you get a different set, you get a different set of Hamiltonians by expanding in the x variable. Uh, it turns out that this will define for you the so-called twisted spin chain, where instead of the periodicity, the spin operators will be uh, under the shift, if you shift the the, uh, along the, if you shift by the period of the chain, the spin matrices will undergo the similarity transformation with the parameter Q with some diagonal, so in this case it's diagonal matrix. Um, and finally, uh, there are different types of solutions of young box equation, which are roughly classified as rational, trigonometric, and elliptic. Um, and there is a complicated story about dynamical matrices which you need to uh, know about, to cover the elliptic case in full generality, which I will not discuss today. And uh, in this way you can uh, get the spin chains where the, uh, the interaction of spins in different directions are different, so the so-called anisotropic spin chain. So for the full anisotropy, uh, you get the so-called elliptic case, which sometimes is called XYZ model. If your anisotropy is only one direction, then this is the trigonometric case or XXZ, 
and the, 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 the uh, isotropic case is rational and it's called XXX pinching. Now, instead of the, uh, in addition to the uh, Hamiltonian system, uh, quantum Hamiltonian system where you study the, the time evolution, you can also do the lattice model where you put your uh, spins on the lattice and sum over all values of, of the spins and do statistical mechanics. And uh, so in the simplest case, so it's, it was hard for me to draw this all. So you, you uh, so the transfer matrices, remember, corresponding to taking a trace over the auxiliary space, which meant that you organize the spins on the loop and take a trace. And now the, the spins which travel in time, so the vertical line is, is uh, like a time for the quantum system, you can now make a loop in time direction as well. And so you impose periodic boundary conditions both in space and time. And if you uh, make several uh, so the time evolution now, it's a finite time evolution. You, you act by transfer matrix once, you act with it twice, three times, and then at some point you stop and take a trace. And so you get uh, the partition function uh, of the lattice model in, in, from the point of view of quantum system is just a trace of the operator of the uh, discrete time evolution. And again, you can introduce the twist this time this twist parameter would be, uh, it has, doesn't have to be, so it, 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 it's a different twist parameter. Uh, so here it was Q, there it will be some, it will be Q tilde. Uh, and so the general lattice model, uh, which you can get in this way, will depend on two types of twist parameters. It will have two types of, uh, two, the, two, uh, two sizes. So the size in the space direction, L, and the size and time direction L tilde. And so ge geometrically what you get is, some, is, is a lattice model uh, in, the, in, and in this present setup, it's a lattice model on, on, on torus because I have uh, I've closed my all, all my loops both in space and time. Uh, and so the partition function is a double trace in the sense that the, tr the transfer matrix the evolution from this side to this side, from this circle to that circle is given by a trace, and then the whole thing is also traced. So that's double trace in that sense, not in the sense of gauge theory, well, by double trace operators, we normally understand the operators which are products of you know, single traces. And so as I said, you have two types of twists. So this, this lattice model will depend on, uh, of, on two sets of twist parameters. And so you get, uh, you can, instead of qu quantum system, you can think about the classical statistical mechanical system where your fluctuating variables are the values of spins attached to the sides, lattice sides, and then Boltzmann weights will be the products of the matrix elements of our matrices attached to the vertices, so with the crossings of all these lattice sides. Now, this lattice point of view, this two-dimensional point of view is interesting because it shows that your partition function will exhibit some modular properties. It will be invariant under the exchanges of the Q versus Q tilde twist parameters and the sizes L versus L tilde. But the Hamiltonian viewpoint where you pick one of the cycles and call it the time cycle is useful because you can write the representation of the partition function in terms of the uh, eigenvalues of the transfer, mat transfer matrix. So instead of the, instead of computing all the matrix elements and taking the products, you can diagonalize these matrices. You can diagonalize them simultaneously, simultaneously because they commute at different values of x. And so this partition function in either choice of, uh, of the time channel will have the form of the sum over the uh, eigenvalues of the transfer matrix and this, the ingenious uh, invention of better which is now called beta ansatz, shows that, uh, so you can, you can represent, parameterize this eigenvalues of the transfer matrix by uh, sets of uh, auxiliary variables which solve certain equations called beta equations. And for each value of the, uh, sorry, yeah, for each number of such, of these auxiliary uh, variables, which are called beta roots, you get a subclass uh, you, have a, you get a subspace in this space of states, uh, 
and then you sum over all such subspaces. So, uh, so in the Hamiltonian viewpoint, in, in order to compute the partition function of the lattice model, you uh, employ the bet ansatz. Uh, so the, the review, I mean, it's a big subject. Again, this is the simplest example with, uh, uh, with SU2 spin group. Instead of, before you compute the transform matrix, which was a trace, you compute the monodromy matrix, which is just a product of our matrices. And so you get this uh, two by two matrix whose matrix elements are the operators in your space of states. And out of this uh, matrix elements, uh, uh, so these matrix elements form an interesting quadratic algebra, which is the Yang-Yen, in fact, of SL2. And uh, by acting on uh, the state with all spins pointing down within, with the upper uh, uh, right element of this matrix, evaluated at special points to be found from the next slide, you get the eigenvectors of the transfer matrix. So in order for this, so this is an ansatz for the eigenvector, and it will be uh, an eigenvector if these parameters sigma 1 to sigma n solve the celebrated, celebrated beta equations. So these are, in this case, these are polynomial in disguise equations on parameter sigma, and they depend on the inhomogeneities of, the, uh, of our spin chain, the twist parameter, and one auxiliary parameter, which is the Planck constant. You can scale it away in the Youngian case. In the trigonometric and elliptic case, you will not be able to scale it. And so, for, so you have, you, so for each n, for each number of, of uh, beta roots, you have a set of equations with a set number of solutions. The number of solutions, in fact, is L choose n. And when you sum over all solutions, you get the uh, 2 to the L, which is the dimension of the Hilbert space. Now, these equations look complicated. So these are, they are polynomial equations, but they look complicated. There is another way of writing these equations in, in terms of using the so-called Q operator. So you can, you, uh, uh, it was not, it was probably not obvious, but there is a sim permutation symmetry which acts on this, on this, on this variable sigma i. And uh, so you can organize the generating function, the polynomial Q whose roots are the bad roots, which is invariant under these permutations. And the, the equations which I had on the previous slide are equivalent to the condition that the polynomial on the left-hand side is divisible by, so where you put Q with shifted arguments, Vanish, so the claim is that it vanishes exact precisely when Q vanishes. And so the, the, the polynomial of in X on the left is divisible by Q. And so in other words, if you divide the left-hand side by, by Q, uh, you, you get uh, the ratio has to have no singularities in the variable X. So that's the content of this equation. So the polynomials P whose roots are homogeneities are called Dreyfus polynomials. And Q uh, of X, whose roots are sigma i, are in fact is in fact an eigenvalue of, of an operator, which you can construct separately, which is called the Baxter operator. Now, the same equation can be written in the following suggestive form, where you introduce the uh, y function, which is a ratio of Q and the shifted version of Q. So this equation you, you saw in, some, in, the, in the disguise in, in the talk by Vasily. Uh, so the left-hand side is just, it's, this, it's the, uh, the, the left-hand side of the uh, TQ equation divided by Q and by P of X minus U. And this is a certain, again, it's an, it's an, you can view it as an eigenvalue of a certain operator, which is the simplest example of the so-called Q character. So the Q characters were introduced by uh, Edward Frankel and Richard Dichin, and also, uh, night, I believe, in the context of yang yang So, um, again, the content of this equation is that T defined in this way is a polynomial in X. So there are no additional poles except for the poles which come from the zeros of the Greenfield polynomial. And so you encounter an operator Y hat, which is a ratio of Q uh, operators. And so the combination Y uh, shift, uh, whose argument was shifted by 2u and something like, like 1 over y uh, 
should should remind you the formula for the fundamental for the character of an of of SU2 or SL2 in the fundamental two-dimensional representation expressed in terms of the eigenvalue. So y hat is like an eigenvalue of some SL2 matrix, which sort of should appear from, from this whole structure. Now you can define these Q characters algebraically for general quivers. So the, the, the universal formula, the first two terms, are, so you, for, for each vertex of a quiver, you start with this generalized eigenvalue y hat, and then there is something like the, the uh, while reflection, multiplicative version of while reflection applied to it, and then you uh, sort of average of the while group, which in fact it's a braid, braid version of the while group, and th that gives you an element of the Yangian of the corresponding Lie algebra built on the, on the quiver gamma, which uh, uh, generate the maximum commutative subalgebra of the, of the non commutative Yangian algebra. Uh, now, again, as I said, so this is actually general construction works for general quivers, in particular for affine quivers, and uh, somehow this was realized approximately at the same time in the gauge theory community, in, in my work with Peston Shatashvili, and in the, in the representation theoretic community, so in the work by Frankel and Hernandez. So this is the formula for the fundamental Q character for the quiver uh, which we call a zero hat. It has one vertex and one loop. So it roughly corresponds to the U1 Katsumudi algebra. And this, so instead of the simple formula with a single, with, with two terms, Y plus one over Y, here the formula is a sum over all uh, partitions, all Young diagrams. And for each Young diagram, you have to compute, you get some rational expression of the, um, of this generalized eigenvalues with arguments shifted depending on the contents of various boxes in the Young diagram. It looks crazy, but, but if you come from, uh, from you know, the st study of, of integrals of the modular spaces of instantons, in this case, the Hilbert scheme of points, this is actually a very natural expression. And it has a meaning which engaged, uh, in fact, the SL2 formula is nice, but it is not very inspiring. When you think about this affine case, you immediately guess where do these formulas come from in gauge theory? And so that would be the crucial, will be crucial for, for what follows. I lost track of time. How much time do I have? Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so, so this was the end of the introduction one. So you know, by now you know everything about spin chains and their relations to Youngians and quantum affine algebras. Now, better gauge correspondence. Uh, so this was built, so this was introduced by Samson Shatashvili and myself a few years ago, built on, on the previous work we, where the relations between, relation between the quantum integrable systems and gauge theories was sort of emerging. Uh, in some sense, the push, which we, I mean, the, the kind of the obvious sign that something interesting is going on uh, was in the, in the paper which I wrote with Greg Moore and Samson Shatashvili in 1997, where we were computing hyper volumes of various hypercalar varieties, regularized volumes of hypercalar varieties, and out of blue, by looking at the uh, Hitchin system, we found the beta equations for the nonlinear Schrodinger system. Uh, but somehow, it, so it was a curiosity, but we couldn't really make much sense of it. And then, uh, almost 10 years later, Gerasimov and Shatashvili sort of came back to this problem, started to you know, poke it from various angles, got me jealous, and then uh, so we realized with Samson that it's a very general story, and it's formulated, in, in fact, in a very simple way. The claim is that if you, that um, the, uh, there is a correspondence between quantum integrable systems and gauge theories with super Poincaré invariance, two-dimensional n equals two super Poincaré invariance. So the correspondence, so this is some kind of dictionary. In this dictionary, the vacuum of gauge theory, the supersymmetric vacuum of gauge theory in finite volume, correspond to the stationary states of integral system, which are joint eigenvectors of quantum integrals of motion. The twisted Kyler ring, which in the gauge theory case has a distinguished basis, actually coming from gauge invariant polynomials on the 
of the uh, 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 scalar field in the vector multiplet, we correspond to quantum integrals of motion, some distinguished basis in the space of quantum integrals of motion, which you can think of, so if, you, if you're familiar with lock separator formalism, it, these are some kind of quantized versions of the uh, traces of powers of lock separator. Uh, but the most interesting aspect of this correspondence was something which could actually be used in, uh, in, uh, in, on the quantum integrable side was that uh, something which you can compute quite uh, generally, quite explicitly on the gauge theory side is the effective twisted superpotential. So it's, a, it's one of the supersymmetry protected terms in the effective uh, uh, action of the theory in which under this, so this is computable under the assumption that all matter fields are massive. So introduce enough uh, twisted masses to be able to integrate the uh, matter fields out. And then in general, you get a one loop exact expression. So uh, this twisted potential in gauge theory will determine the uh, vacua, the in general massive vacua of the theory and on the, on the quantum integral side, it corresponds to the so-called Yang-Yang functional. So in, in the early days of beta ansatz, people have realized that there is some, some, something miraculous is going on. Every time one, can, one is able to write beta equations for an integral system, these equations, so these are in general n equations on n unknowns, but in fact, these are not the most general systems of n equations on n unknowns. They have a potential. And so this potential is called Yang-Yang functional. So the equations roughly have the form that the derivative of single function with respect to your variables is equal to something like an integer. Uh, so the example of such correspondence is, uh, again, if you go, so since the textbook example of integrable system is a spin chain, so what's the text, what's the corresponding quant what's the corresponding gauge theory? It turns out to be the two-dimensional n equals four UN gauge theory with L hypermultiple that's in the fundamental representation, which is softly broken down to n equals two by a twisted mass, which corresponds to a sp specific U1 symmetry. It's the same U1 symmetry which I mentioned in the ALE case. It's a, this uh, master symmetry. And so you can turn on the, uh, so in, in n equals two theories in two dimensions, you can turn on twisted masses which correspond to symmetry, global symmetries. And uh, so there is a dictionary that the, uh, this mass corresponds to the U parameter of the uh, Yangian. The inhomogeneities would correspond to the twisted masses of the flavor symmetry. This, 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 this is a symmetry which does not break n plus four supersymmetry. And the twist parameter corresponds to the Keller modulus. It's the exponential of the I theta angle minus the phi Leopold's term. And then the beta equations would become the twisted color ring re relations the, or quantum cohomology in more mathematical context. And the solutions are the eigenvalues of the complex scalar in the UN vector multiplet. So this N uh, beta roots and the, the permutation symmetry which you see explicitly on the quantum integrable side becomes the residual gauge symmetry or acting on the eigenvalues of, uh, of an adjoint valued scalar in the UN gauge symmetry. And so these equations have a potential as promised. Uh, so if you, if you write them by multiplying everything on, on, on uh, so that the equations have the form one is equal to something, this is something is actually exponential of the derivative of, of the twisted potential. And so you can integrate this equation, integrate the logarithm of this equation to, produce, to get the formula for W tilde. Uh, and so you, you get a bunch of uh, things like x log x, and that's a one loop exact computation. Uh, something with the with the lights. The lights have been dimmed. I don't know what happened. Okay. Okay. Sorry. So it means I have to speed up. All right. The <laughs> maybe I'll maybe I'll speak louder <laughs> to compensate for for low visibility. Uh, so the Baxter, the Q operator, which uh, played plays a crucial important role in in analysis in the functional beta on that turns out to be simply the characteristic polynomial of the adjoint Higgs, something which is very natural on, on, on the gauge theory side. It's an operator which depends on the auxiliary parameter x, 
there is some mathematical version of, of this identification. It's been uh, actually uh, made more precise and improved uh, recently in the work uh, by uh, Pushkar, Smirnov, and Seidlin, even in the K-theoretic context. So, uh, but roughly speaking, what happens is that you can, this gauge theory at low energies describes maps of the wall sheet, the, some, the wall sheet sigma, two-dimensional limit surface sigma, into the, uh, what we would call the Higgs branch of this theory, which is the cotangent bundle to the Grassmannian of n-dimensional planes in the L-dimensional complex vector space. And so these equations, the bad equations, are the quantum cohomology describe the quantum cohomology ring of this space. It's, non -compact, it's a non-compact space, but we work equivalently with respect to symmetries which have uh, uh, isolated or compact uh, set of fixed points. So the, U, the U1 symmetry, the most important U1 symmetry, which I mentioned, is the one which rotates the fibers of the cotangent bundle. And so when you work equivalently with respect to that symmetry, it's as good or as bad as working with Grassmannian itself. Okay, you can lift this theory to three dimensions or to four dimensions, and that would give you the better equations of the corresponding X, XZ uh, or XYZ models. There is a complication in the elliptic case in this uh, when you lift to four dimensions. This most important U1 symmetry, which I mentioned, becomes anomalous unless there is a certain uh, relation between the number of flavors and number of colors. And that corresponds to the fact that the bad equations for the XYZ model only make sense when, the num when N, the number of better roots or the number of spins which point up, is exactly half of the number of the size of the spin chain. Uh, which physically means that when you are fully anisotropic, you cannot actually fix the number of spins pointing up. So on average, you have uh, total spin is zero. And so it means that on average, half of the spins is pointing up. Okay, so the question which uh, was not understood until very recently was what is the gauge theory meaning of T, of the transfer matrix eigenvectors? And what is the meaning of the TQ relations? Uh, so instead of answering this question right away, I will now generalize, first of all. So instead of, uh, so we'll consider the more general gauge theories, the so-called quiver gauge theories. In quiver gauge theories, uh, so the quiver, again, we have this, it's a graph with a set of vertices and edges. It's an oriented graph. So for each edge, you have a source and target. So it's, here are some examples of quivers. This is an A3 type quiver, E6 or A0 hat, which we saw before. Uh, now the gauge group will be the product of the set of vertices of the quiver of unitary gauge groups. For each uh, uh, node of the quiver, you assign, you, uh, you assign a number ni and put a unitary gauge group. Put, put a unitary, uh, well, you, you put vector space with Hermitian structure and the corresponding symmetry group. So the product of all these unitary groups is the gauge group of your theory. Correspondingly, you have vector multiplied scalars. So we, have, we start with n equals four supersymmetric theory in two dimensions. So you have two complex scalars uh, in the very thin adjoint per each uh, gauge group factor. And then you, uh, the, as matter multiplets, will take uh, fundamentals, fundamental hypermultiplets, which split as a fundamental and anti fundamental chiral multiplets uh, in the n equals 2 language. So they, they are valued in the space of homes between some vector, fixed vector spaces Li attached to the vertices and the uh, color vector spaces and I where the gauge group acts. And so you have Q and Q tilde, they take values in dual vector spaces. And then there are bifundamental hypermultiplets which, which are assigned to the edges. And so you have Q which acts along the, the arrow from the source space to the target space and Q tilde which acts opposite in opposite direction. So the standard N equals for Lagrangian written in N equals two superspace language has a superpotential, which has this form. And again, this has some symmetries which allow you to introduce various uh, masses, various twisted masses 
And in particular, there is a most important U1 symmetry, which scales uh, both fundamentals and anti-fundamentals in the same way and compensates uh, by scaling the one of the scalars in the vector multiplet with, with twice the opposite strength. So that the superpotential is actually invariant under the symmetry. And now for generic values of twisted masses, you can integrate out the, twisted, the, the, uh, uh, the, the matter fields and end up with the effective twisted superpotential, which has this form. So uh, with this function var pi, it's a kind of elementary function, which uh, in, in, in the rational case, which is the two-dimensional case, has this form. It's the antiderivative of the logarithm. If you live to three dimensions, so add the circle to your theory, it will become essentially dialogarithm. And if you go to, to, if you add two circles, it will be an infinite sum of dialogarithms. You might call it an elliptic di dialogarithm. So again, the supersymmetric vacua of this quiver gauge theory will be given by the solutions of the equations where the derivative of the, of the twist superpotential are quantized in units of 2 pi i. And um, remarkably, all these equations correspond to better equations of some spin chain with the Youngian symmetry b uh, based on the Katz-Moody algebra built on the quiver. So this, uh, this is Youngian in the two-dimensional case, quantum of fine algebra in the three-dimensional case, or elliptic uh, in the four-dimensional case. Okay. Again, you can formulate these equations is as an analyticity condition. So it's a condition that certain expression uh, built out of the generalized eigenvalue functions y, so these y's will be built out of sigmas, eigenvalues of sigma, eigenvalues of the uh, sigma uh, scalars in vector multiplets, has no singularities in the auxiliary variable x, except for the poles coming from uh, uh, these L factors, these are uh, built out of matter multiplets. And this, the meaning of this combination, so it just, uh, in gauge theory, you can just say that, well, this is some operator which is natural because uh, you can formulate the conditions for the vacua as analytic, analytistic conditions on, 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 on this operator, on the expectation values of this operator. Um, but it will be, uh, so we will we'll see that it has more uh, straightforward uh, generalization, uh, straightforward inter, um, definition. Okay, finally, the, in, uh, we, we were interested in computing various partition functions, the partition function of the quantum, si quantum system on, uh, when you take the product, when you take the uh, time evolution operator or generalized time evolution operator, or if you like Gibbs ensemble partition function, and take a trace. So that translates in the gauge theory context to computing the partition function, supersymmetric partition function of that gauge theory on, uh, on the rim surface of topology of a torus, so torus partition function. So there it's a Witten index, which by the usual, uh, so assuming that all the vacuum of your theory are bosonic will be essentially the same thing as, as the so it's a sum, sum of the vacuum of exponentials, exponential minus the vacuum expectation value of the corresponding operator. And so uh, to get the lattice model partition function on the nose, you would have to sum over various types of gauge theories. So you will sum over the ranks of gauge groups attached to the nodes of your quiver, the Witten indices of these different gauge theories with some fugacities Q tilde. So Q tilde here is the fugacity which uh, labels different gauge groups. This is not unheard of. This procedure is, is familiar in matrix models. In matrix models, very often it's convenient not to fix the, the size of the matrix, but the sum of the matrices. But even then, it is a formal, usually the, there it's a formal procedure, formal you know, trick. So why do we sum over ranks, and why do we choose these couplings T and observables O in such a way that this exponentiated, the corresponding exponentiated operator in the quantum integrable site becomes a product of transfer matrices. So it turns out that, that the gauge theory operator, which is 
beta gauge dual to the transfer matrix is a very natural observable within a twisted chiral ring. It is well behaved with respect to number of Dyson Schwinger relations. So very uh, so this is a slide borrowed from a four-dimensional talk. So today's talk is, so to speak, two-dimensional. Our gauge theories have two-dimensional superpoint current invariance. But this is a reflection, this is a particular uh, case of a more general phenomena. In addition to the standard dyson schwinger relations, which we are, uh, learned about in the standard course of quantum field theory, which expressed the invariance of path integral under small uh, field redefinitions corresponding to the changes in the contour of, uh, of path integration, there are remarkably relations between the uh, contributions to path integral coming from different instanton sectors. So the contributions of, of, uh, to the path integral of uh, various topological, different topological sectors in the field space turn out to be related. And so the analyticity properties of this uh, T observables or Q character observables are precisely the relations between the uh, different instanton contributions to the path uh, to the correlation functions of your gauge theory. So these are this is this pole constellation thing. But th so this is uh, it's a way of building up these op operators within gauge theory, but it's a very complicated way. So you have to average over some kind of wild group, which uh, uh, corresponds to matching of contributions between different instanton sectors. String theory, which we'll, we'll go to in the next section, gives, gives a straightforward definition of these observables. But let me just finish with a couple of remarks. Uh, if your quiver gamma is one of the fine linking diagrams, then the bad equations which you will get would correspond to spin chains with Kasmuni spin groups. And so this is actually the way these were discovered before they, they were introduced in the, in, the usual, in the community of quantum integrable systems. There are also gauge theories which correspond to super Lie algebras. They are uh, so more, slightly more complicated than the ones which I described, but not too, too complicated. And you can consider general quivers, not necessarily of AZ type. Uh, so what, gen what changed from the from the old results of Nakajima and Varagnola and all, was that the two-dimensional perspective, two and high-dimensional perspective, introduced uh, additional parameters into the game, the Keller moduli, which correspond to twist parameters on the, on the uh, quantum integrable side. And so that allows you to <coughs> scan through the whole set of commutative subalgebras of Youngian or quantum, quantum of fine algebras, and not only the so-called uh, Gelfand-Seitlin subalgebras, which you see in the conventional approach of Nakajima and Varagnola, when you study, in physics language, you study supersymmetric quantum mechanics as opposed to the single model. So you lose the uh, Keller parameters. Okay, uh, so this is something for the conclusions. Uh, in the original formulation of beta gauge correspondence, uh, <coughs> so I spoke about, I talked about the, the quantum integrals of motion, the community of subalgebras of, of a non-commutative structure. Of course, in the original formulation, the question was asked, how do you see the full non-abelian structure, the one which gives it actually the rigidity to the whole construction? And the idea was that the, the, uh, all the generators of the Youngian will come from the studies of domain walls, viewed, used, viewed as operators. So that they would allow you to build correspondences between different quantum field theories as in the theory of S-brains. Um, recently, there was a tremendous progress in this. Uh, I mean, in fact, the non abelian structure was actually constructed in, within the gauge linear Siegel model using the stable envelope approach of uh, uh, Okunkov and uh, Malik and uh, Ganaji Okunkov. Uh, but the relation to the original domain wall construction is still not understood. So there is something to work on, I, 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 to work out, I think. Now, uh, am I, is my time is up? Past time? Okay, sorry. I'm, mm, all right. Um, so let me skip some of the slides. Uh, <laughs> and since this is a string math conference, so let me go to the string theory realization of these models, which will produce uh, 
first of all, solve some puzzles and will connect the approach to the relation between gauge theory and, and integrable systems, which I've been discussing so far, to the approach which was recently uh, uh, proposed by Kevin Costello. In fact, in the slides, which I skipped, it was explained it was actually it's a revival of the old approach which was in my PhD thesis. But uh, since I skipped it, so I will not, I'll say no more. Okay, so uh, using the classical work of Douglas and Moore, so it's so classical that I forgot to put the names, I'm sorry. Uh, it's a mistake which I should, should have done, but many people do this, make this mistake. So the quiver gauge theories which I reviewed are the perfect examples of gauge theories which you will find by studying D-brains sitting at the tip of the ALE singularity in the orbifold limit. So Greg and Mike Douglas worked out in 1996, I believe, that uh, you can uh, do a truncation of maximal supersymmetric Young Nose theory, which will produce precisely the quiver gauge theories of, of the type which I discussed, if you uh, do the following. So in order to uh, land on the precise gauge theories which I discussed, you have to do the following. You start with type 2b string on the following 10-dimensional background. You take the ALE space, times an elliptic curve E times a two-dimensional torus, which I will not call an elliptic curve because I will not care about its complex structure, times a, a, a two-dimensional flat space, R2. And then we'll introduce a little twist into the problem. Namely, we make this R2 space rotate as we go around uh, the cycles on the elliptic curve. And also, at the same time, the ALE space will rotate. Uh, and there is some relation. So it's the, it's a U1 isometry of the product of the ALE space and R2, which we'll be using. It's a U1 symmetry which preserves a holomorphic top form on the product of ALE space and R2. Now, uh, in order for this symmetry to be present, you have to sp specialize to the special locus and the modular space of ALE spaces. You have to set the complex parameters to zero. And uh, more mathematically speaking, you twist the ALE space with a line bundle of elliptic curve, and then this R2 you identify with a copy of the uh, negative square of the same line bundle. And then we add uh, fractional D-brains. So we have to add lots of deep types, of lo uh, lots of D-brains. So we have we add seven brains, which will wrap the ALE space, elliptic curve, and these two torus. So it's an eight-dimensional world volume altogether. It's, in order for this construction to work, you have to think of the elliptic curve to have a vanishingly small size. Otherwise, the back reaction of the seven brains on the background will be too, too significant. So here, we neglect the back reaction. And then we add D3 brains, which will wrap the elliptic curve and two torus. So the co-dimension of three brains inside seven brains is four, and that's the context in which you see the instantons on the ALE space. And so Douglas and Moore showed that uh, the gauge theory which lives on, on the three brains is the quiver gauge theory of the type which I described. Now, there are instanton sectors in this gauge theory which correspond to the virtual D1 strings which are wrapping the elliptic curve, which we will sum, we'll be summing over. And these are fractional brains, meaning that secretly they, are, they could be higher dimensional brains which wrap various two cycles in the ALE space. So that allows you to have arbitrary labels, n, n0, n1, and r, and so on and so forth. So this is the setup for gauge theories. Uh, so the fractionalization means that the numbers of brains are not numbers, but multi-numbers. So these are vectors. And we have the non-compact brains, which we fix. And we have compact brains, which wrap the compact uh, four-dimensional and two-dimensional tori, and so we sum over them. So this is uh, what you're supposed to do in string theory, because these are, you know, finite mass objects. They're, you view them as virtual particles. That's the string, th string theory explanation for why do you have to sum over the ranks of gauge groups. And then the Q character, this special observable, the remarkable observable, which has analytic proper, interesting analytic properties, in string theory also has a very simple uh, representation. It's actually a stack of D5 brains, wrap D5 brains, which wrap a elliptic space and elliptic curve. And they, they look like points on the T2, 
So this T2 is actually the world volume of gauge theory. So they correspond to local operators on, on, on in, in this two-dimensional gauge theory. So this is the full set of brains which we need to produce the partition function of the gauge theory, which is by gauge, better gauge correspondence is the same thing as a partition function of lattice model. Now we'll get a kind of a six-dimensional version of Chen Simon's theory, which will be describing the same thing. So we employ T duality, and there are two types of T dualities one, one can employ. So one T duality will dualize all of the elliptic curve and one of the cycles on the torus T2. So I, I, I do perform three T dualities, also known as mirror symmetry. And that maps type 2B theory into ty to type 2A. Now, the brains which we had, some, so the brains which were wrapping the elliptic curve will be now, will not be wrapping it anymore because we t dualized, t -dualized the elliptic curve. And so the D1 strings will become D0 brains which will wrap, which will, whose walled lines will wrap uh, one cycles on the torus. And D3 brains after three T dualities will become also D0 brains which will, whose walled volumes will be wrapping dual to uh, one cycle on the elliptic curve. And all these are dissolved inside D4 brains, which are wrapping, still wrapping the Elise space. And they're fixed somewhere, and they're wrapping the same one cycles on the elliptic curve. So the important thing is that, uh, OK, so there is a magnetic frame. So there is another T duality where you don't touch the elliptic curve and only T dualize one of the circles on, on, on T2. So then, instead of D4 brains, you get D6 brains wrapping ALE space and elliptic curve. And then, uh, instead of, so the, you have D2 brains wrapping elliptic curve and uh, one of the, the A or B cycles on, 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 uh, on T2. Now, the, the, the stri string theory explanation of Mackey duality is that in type 2A setup, if you go in the orbifold limit, so we now blow down all the cycles and also tune the uh, B field along the, the two cycles, when you actually get single uh, wall sheet CFT describing this uh, background, you get an enhancement of gauge symmetry in space-time. You get six-dimensional AD gauge multiplet, which will be sitting at the fixed point of this orbifold. So out of uh, twisted sector of the closed string, and the D brains wrapping the vanishing cycles of the least space emerges the non-abelian vector multiplet of n equals one comma one six-dimensional supersymmetry, and so this soup of gauge multi gauge fields live, lives in six dimensions, which is the product of the dual elliptic curve, T two and R two. Now these brains which we had added in our construction become sources for these gauge fields. And when you think about them, they become actually they're electric sources. So they actually couple to gauge fields directly. Um, now in magnetic frame, things are in both simpler and more complicated. They are simpler in the sense that the closed ring background is simply this ALE space cross R2, which is still twisted over the elliptic curve. And so the six-dimensional vector multiplet, which lives on this part of the space-time, uh, sees the superion mills, ADE superion mills, with omega deformation uh, on R2. And with the mass uh, giving, so, so, so in, there are four scalars in, in six-dimensional vector multiplet. Two of them are twisted in going around the elliptic curve. They correspond to this zeta C parameters of a release space. They, they are massive and two big, uh, massless. So this is uh, the root of Higgs branch type background. Uh, unfortunately, the sources, so the fractional D brains, which we get by, by T duality, they couple magnetically to, uh, to, to the six dimensional gauge fields. So it's hard to describe them in, in this uh, frame. Uh, but if you, Slow the f if you do the dimensional reduction, on, so think about this vanishing size of the elliptic curve, you get effectively four-dimensional n equals two star theory with a special mass of the hypermultiplet with omega deformation in two dimensions. And then these magnetic sources 
they become just hooked operators wrapped on AOB cycles of, of two tors. And that's something which is more or less familiar, but hasn't been t studied too well. Instead, let's go to electric, electric, electric frame where we do t dualize the elliptic curve. And then the fact that in the original background, things were twisted around the elliptic curve, meaning that the metric had off diagonal components. So, so the, the, there were non-zero matrix, metric elements with one leg along, let's say, R2, and another leg on the elliptic curve, and also one leg on the elliptic space, and another leg on the elliptic curve. Upon t-duality, these off diagonal uh, metric elements will become a B-field. It's a Neverschwarz B-field with non-trivial field strength. And so that's, the, by the usual, if you like, anomaly considerations, or, if you, or simply by reducing the CGG Chen Simons term in 11 dimensions, you will get the Chen Simons coupling for this super young mules in six dimensions of the form Chen Simons of the gauge field, which the flux of the uh, st field strength of the B field. And then by some kind of supersymmetric localization, so this Chen Simons term has to be supplemented by other terms to make this whole thing supersymmetric. After all, the G brain configuration, which configurations which we use to preserve supersymmetry. And so that uh, this R2 piece is the one on which the omega deformation was non-trivial. So by localization, you will end up with Chen Simon's term of the form that Kevin was, was talking about. The last, very last part of my talk concerns the, <laughs> sorry. Uh, something funny has happened in, in, in all in, in these considerations. The computation which we were doing in the, uh, gauge theory in two dimensions or in, in its higher dimensional upgrades was the one loop computation. It was the exact computation. Uh, you only had to, to take into account one loop of massive fields. And that produced this plethora of beta equations with all its non glory and non-reality. Now, if you lift this one loop of matter fields into string theory context, that means that you are computing something like an annulus diagram. So you have so the, op the matter fields are the open strings stretched between uh, these D3 brains. And so as the matter field traces a loop, the, the open string traces a cylinder with two ends on two types of brains. So this is an annulus diagram with the annulus wall sheet and two types of three brain boundary conditions on two ends, which as we all know, you can also interpret as a closed string exchange. So if you go to the closed string channel, think of the same diagram as a very long cylinder. And then it becomes the exchange of gluons of the uh, G uh, gauge group, of the AD gauge group. Because after all, it, some of the, so the gluons are actually complicated bits. But if you think about the abelian part of the, abelian part of the AD gauge group, that part that comes uh, that has a perturbative origin. So these are twisted sector closed strings, and so these are these closed strings which you are exchanging in in doing the one loop open string computation. So uh, the same computation which produced uh, the bet equations in in one picture becomes a single gluon exchange computation in a different picture, which uh, which is what the R where the R matrix comes from. Okay, one word about the, maybe not. Okay, so the, <laughs> we got the electric sources, which actually are line operators. I didn't call them Wilson loops, although one might be tempted to, to call them Wilson loops, because they're exactly not always, they're not always Wilson loops. So what they really are, so these are D0 brains running around the loop on a circle on the torus, and these D0 brains are attached to D4 brain, which wraps the ALE space. So if you, you know, take a point of view of the zero brain, just look at through its eyes, whatever, whatever they are, you see the modular space of instantons on the early space, the one which we start with. And so what you see is quantum mechanics on the modular space of instantons. With vacua being the cohomology spaces, and then for the dual cycle, you have uh, other types of the zero brains, and it's other modular space of instantons. And then you have a closed string exchange between them formerly known as one loop open string diagram, which now becomes a gluon exchange between two electric, electric sources. 
Now, if you try to describe this electric source by an operator in the AD gauge theory, the first, the first approximation what you should write is not the naive Wilson loop operator, but in fact, it's Kasmudi version. Because remember, this Nakajima story, the uh, cohomology of the modular space of instantons gives you a representation of Katsmudi. So it's an infinite dimensional representation. And so it's some a fine upgrade of the conventional Wilson loop where you introduce the grazing operator. And you can actually exchange, expand this in ordinary Wilson loops. So you, as you can expand the representation of Katsmudi into the fine, in fine dimensional representations of ordinary group fine dimensional groups, but you might find surprises. And one of the surprises is this celebrated 29 equals 21, uh, 28 plus 1 uh, um, uh, relation that, that uh, Vasily mentioned, that if you do it for in, in the case of, even for fine dimensional quivers, in the case of D4, you will not get an irreducible representation of, uh, of the gauge group. Okay, so uh, there are some, um, Dictionary, there is some dictionary about in the story with appearance of flat connections and so on and so forth. The fact that you can fix the twist parameters, meaning they can fix the flat connection, actually requires the presence of this additional R2 piece. You cannot do it in four dimensions on compact space. Uh, you can take a limit in which you uh, send the string coupling to zero if, you're, uh, if you don't have, uh, if you set some of them uh, numbers of, of the brains to zero, and effectively meaning that you study fine quiver case as opposed to affine quivers. In this case, you can formulate the whole story within a little string theory, and so then this will be the open string, open closed little string duality. Um, finally, uh, the approach that um, uses the Chen Simons theory and thus perturbative computations in chin simons theory has many advantages that you can study Wilson loops which are not necessarily straight Wilson loops, which we, we had. Uh, uh, the group is explicitly there, but it seems uh, problematic to generalize it to, you know, the whole generality of cases which we can cover with better gauge correspondence. But the fact that there is such a relation and there is T-duality which relates these two stories means that there is a generalization of of this model to other cases, in particular superalgebras. So that clearly there are lots of things to learn to understand. And uh, one of the wild speculations which I would like to put forward is that probably by thinking about this story more thoroughly, we will understand the origin of the EA gauge field, which seems to be lurking in the somewhere in the backyard of M theory. On this, I'd like to thank you for your patience, and again, the organizers and all of you. <laughs> thank you.